Are you ready for rapid fire? Let's do it. We are 20 minutes in and we haven't even gotten to the hot topics. Seriously. Fill in the blank. It's blank that Phil Steele Magazine has Notre Dame's wide receivers rank as the number 10 unit in the nation heading into this season. It's freaking exciting. When's the last time that we've seen Notre Dame wide receivers, you know, so hyped up? We, we've been asking for production. We've been asking for at least a thousand, you know, yard receiver. We've been asking for a guy to get over 30, 40 receptions outside of Michael Mayer, right? We want consistency at the position. We don't want a tight end that is, you know, a glorified wide receiver. We want true wide receivers to stretch the field deep vertical threats, someone to go up and high point the ball and get some of those touchdown passes, right? And then you want some of those quicker, faster guys to work underneath uh, and really, you know, put safeties and linebackers in a bind. So to me, it's really exciting. Is it a little premature? Yeah, because Notre Dame doesn't have quite the track record. So to come out and say, you know, on paper, yeah, Notre Dame has a number 10, you know, most exciting wide receiver room. Okay, that's fine. But now it's time to go out and execute. There's a lot of unanswered questions. There's a lot of turnover. You have, a, you know, Mike Brown is now the wide receiver coach after Chauncey Stuckey left. You have a, a, a mixture of, you know, guys who stayed, a couple grad transfers. There's a lot of question marks. But I still think it's something to be excited about combined with Ryan Leonard's talent. Yeah, I guarantee they weren't ranked number 10 last year. But it also shows that they're doing their homework because a, a lot of laziness tends to happen with some of these preseason publications. It's like, oh, you look at last year's production. Oh, okay. Well, what have they done? You know, oh, okay. They actually did go out and add a couple guys, significant guys from the transfer portal. So one, they've done their job by actually researching Notre Dame and taking a look at them. But just for everything that you said, the fact that they are ranked so high, especially considering where they were Last year, I mean, they, they were probably lucky if they were top 100 unit last year. And now they're a top 10 unit. And, uh, you know, and like Joe makes a good point, getting him hyped up for a letdown. I mean, that's like, that's, come on, you, we're, we're still dealing with BKPTSD, I think, at that point, if that's the, the, the direction you're going. New era, year three, Marcus Freeman, new quarterback, new receivers, the whole thing. It's a revamped room from the you know, from the position coach to the to the offensive coordinator to the actual bodies in the room. So I think you know, I think Vince and I were talking when we actually got done with the show yesterday, right after we wrapped up. It's exciting to think about. We could actually see true elite level quarterback play this season combined with elite level wide receivers helping out this season so that's that's what it all comes down to to me but uh stymie does you know have a good question what is a magazine like <laughs> do you can you even find an, an actual hard copy magazine outside of an airport newsstand these days like where i think the grocery store yeah uh, it's probably a good point like walmart meyer whatever it happens to be martin's dk Parker. Thank you for the super chat for Jesse. One Red Bull and Tito's <laughs> coming up. Thanks. Did you take any allergy medicine today? Or no? You know, I, it's that's obvious. That's obvious. Just you I know, told you my eyes. Take the, the clarity. You know, do you have any in the medicine cabinet? Yes. Okay. Well, what are you even doing then? What are you even doing <laughs> if you've got it and you're not taking it? Well, the issue is is I need to take my contacts out because like the the allergens and the pollutants and all that gunk are on my contacts but i hate doing the show with my glasses on because uh, of the glare so I really i'm just sucking it up for everyone here i think you're distracting everyone <laughs> with all your itching and everything else that you've got going on all right we'll see if you can uh, kind of burrow on through here if you could have made one USC football player, if you could pick one former USC football player all time and have him play for Notre Dame instead of USC, what player are you picking? Um, To me, 
I went with, again, these questions are always kind of fall in my era or my generation of when I was around to watch. Okay. I, I, I've got an idea of who I'm expecting, but go ahead. I mean, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a pretty easy list. I think when you think about it, it comes down to Matt Liner, Carson Palmer, um, you go Reggie Bush, you could go Tyron Smith. That's not a real sexy pick, but yeah. Troy Palomalu could be on that list. Uh, hey, you can only pick one. So who are junior, you going with? Junior you, you know, Seau could be on that list. You're doing the typical Jesse cop out and just rattling off 20 different guys. No, you I'm can giving pick you one. So I'm giving you my be? thought process. Okay. So your your lifetime, sticks. your lifetime, basically. You're yeah. you're watching. <laughs> John says OJ Simpson. I don't know if that's a joke or if that's serious, but okay. I mean, really, I just have to go, and I know this sounds like an easy answer, but it has to be Reggie Bush because I felt like Notre Dame, between Jimmy Clausen and Brady Quinn, like the quarterbacks were there. Like, yeah, like Liner and Palmer are, are what they are, but I'm going to roll the dice on my guys, right? Like the, the, the talent level was pretty – pretty there. It's just the other guys kind of went on and had a little bit more success in the NFL. But when you look at what could have made the difference to me was an explosive running back coming out of the backfield and a, and a running back Notre Dame didn't have to worry about defensively. So, you know, that's, that's kind of where I fall. I, I think Keyshawn Johnson could also maybe fall on that list. Yeah. Uh, but I don't think he was too, you know, impactful. So for me, I, I just have to go Ooh, with. You'd have a hard Bush. time convincing him of that. Yeah. <laughs> Plus, he hates Notre Dame. I don't know if he hates Notre Dame just because he went to and, USC or if he went to USC because he hates Notre Dame. But You know, John actually brings up a really good one here, Caleb Williams, because that was in a window where you, know, you ask a lot of Notre Dame fans Notre if, Dame they, the last, yeah. if you swap in a, a really good quarterback with the defense that they had last year, yeah. what could they potentially overcome in combination? So I think that's a really good answer. Um and again, it just feels not right because of how recent it is. So I'm going to go Reggie Bush, but Caleb Williams is a very close second. Yeah, because, you know, like I think if you look back at at Matt Leinart, for example, if you swapped out Brady Quinn for Matt Leinart. That's what I, I mean. I don't think you're that much better. That that team was still more about the overall talent that Matt Leinart had, him, had around him in comparison to, you know, the, the, the overall entirety of what Notre Dame's roster had. But yeah, I mean, like Caleb Williams – you throw him in there the last two years, like think about the fact what Marcus Freeman was able to do in year one with Drew Pine and Tyler Buckner. And then last year with an okay Sam Hartman, but as improved as the defense was, I mean, you're probably talking about a playoff team at, at, at a minimum last year, if not the last two years under Marcus Freeman, if they have Caleb Williams. So, I mean, that is, that is a good call. Like if you just go here recently, I, you know, I went back and, and kind of looked, you know, more macro at this. And I just, man, like Marcus Allen is a guy that, that the chiefs running back. Uh, that's, I mean, he ended up with the chiefs for, I think it was the last four years after he left the Raiders, but you know, he backed up and blocked for Charles white at USC for two years while Charles White was winning the Heisman. And then his senior year, he runs for over 2,300 yards and wins a Heisman of his own. And then, you know, he got kind of got, you know, jerked around by Al Davis with, with the Raiders and all that stuff. But Marcus Allen was just like, he was so smooth. He glided in that stride that he had, and he never took big hits because it seemed like he had – eyes in the back of his head and he was just such a pure runner so i would go with marcus allen like the best running back notre dame had back in that day was vegas ferguson another really good running back but marcus allen won the heisman then he went on to the pro football hall of fame so i would go with with uh with marcus there late 70s early 80s guy some other good ones though Ronnie Lott, that guy was a monster. Have you ever seen like old footage of, of Ronnie Lott with the 49ers and some of the hits he laid on people? I did not, or I have not. He was he was basically like Troy Palomalu before Troy Palomalu. Stymie says Clay Matthews. I love Clay Matthews when he was playing for the Cleveland Browns in the 
in the in the seventies and eighties, like just classic. When you think of old school middle linebacker, Clay Matthews was it. It was obviously he was Clay Matthews senior or you know Clay Matthews Junior's dad. So I, I think that's who he's talking. Maybe he's talking about Junior for that matter. But when I like when you say Clay Matthews, I think of of Senior. All right, so a few Notre Dame game lines on FanDuel right now. Notre Dame plus one and a half, so a one and a half point underdog against Texas A&M. They are nine and a half point favorites against Louisville, four and a half point favorites against Florida State, and three and a half point favorites against USC. Which of those two lines are you most confident in for the Irish right now? Most confident they'll cover? Um, I'm most confident in... First and foremost, the plus one and a half versus Texas A&M because I think they're going to win that game. Um, so that immediately, you know, takes care of that one. The Louisville game, I wouldn't touch. Nine and a half is big, especially for a team that beat you the way they did last year. So already kind of spooked by that. So it comes down to Florida State and USC. Florida State's at home. I think they're going to have – so there's two things. Like Florida State, I feel like, is a better team. But I like Notre Dame at home. Um, USC is a lesser of a team, but then there's always, you know, going on the road against one of your rivals. So to me, I like USC just because, um, I don't like the shape that their roster is in. I think there's a bit more turnover and the way they performed last season with Caleb Williams at quarterback. I, I just feel a little bit more confident in that situation. So I'll start backwards and go forwards since you were just talking about USC I actually I, I don't like that since it is the last game of the season this year who knows exactly what either team is going to be by Thanksgiving weekend especially USC they could either be completely outperforming what we thought or completely underperforming it three and a half like if you wanted to take it right now is actually not bad because of the fact that it's at the end of the season and Notre Dame should be the better team Four and a half against Florida State at home. I feel fairly comfortable in that right now, but still kind of, you know, not real sure. I love the Texas A&M, like we're talked about. I think Notre Dame should be at least a three and a half point favorite at Texas A&M based on the quarterbacks alone and the fact that Notre Dame definitely has a championship level defense. Whether or not Texas A&M is that improved by game one, either offensively or defensively, I think is a big question. I actually like that nine and a half against Louisville right now because I'm feeling like Notre Dame is just going to blow the brakes off Louisville at home. I think last year was a, a total aberration. I realize nine and a half points is big, but I actually – and more confident in that nine and a half against Louisville than either of those other two games they're favored in right now because of where it is. You know, the fact that it's a home game, the fact that they've got last year's Louisville game as a motivation, all that kind of stuff. All right. We know the uh, L.A. Lakers kind of went and made, uh, you know, the off the beaten path choice by hiring J.J. Redick as their head coach last week. Let me ask you this one. Which polarizing team, professional team, is under the most pressure to win a championship? The Yankees, the Lakers, or the Cowboys? Yeah, so the way I looked at this was, you know, I, I guess I'll kind of talk through my, my breakdown on this one. The Yankees, they haven't won a World Series since 2009. And, and not only that, but they haven't been back to a World Series since 2009, if, if my memory serves me right. Um, the Los Angeles Lakers won a championship in the bubble. I know that's highly scrutinized because it was the bubble. Right. You know, I, the thing about that one compared to the other sports seasons is like baseball, for example, is the baseball was a completely condensed season. The NBA season was pretty much wrapped up, you know, by like the playoffs were just on the horizon as they entered their bubble. Right. So like, I get it, but at the same time, I don't because they played a full season. They put everyone in the bubble. Everyone played how they played. They won a championship. Okay, whatever. Before that, their championship came in 2009 and 2010. So the repeat, you know, when Kobe and, and I believe Shaq won their championships. 
So that puts the Yankees and the Lakers kind of in the same boat, really. 2009, 2010 was their most recent success. And then for the Cowboys, you got to go back all the way to, what, like 1996? Super Bowl 30. Yep. And and the thing about the Cowboys is, and, and you know, I guess in cross comparison to the Lakers and the Yankees, is that the, the Yankees and the Lakers consistently have been in the playoffs. You know, the Yankees, while haven't been, you know, as many World Series, they've made some AL championships. They've, you know, made progression in the playoffs. Cowboys, not so much. So final verdict, I'm going to have to go with the Yankees because I think the Yankees have ownership that are committed to winning and expending all resources, a.k.a. money, on winning. Like, look at their lineup this year. It's Aaron Judge, Juan Soto, you know, uh, Verdugo. Like, they have the highest payroll. They're willing to spend money. Can't say the same about the Cowboys. The Cowboys aren't necessarily, in my opinion, you know, all the way in. And so you combine a, a franchise that has a lot of expectations, that expends a lot of resources in comparison to the rest of the league, and they haven't been to a World Series since 2009. I'm circling back to the Yankees. So you're going with the Yankees. Um, I'm going to go Lakers, and here's why. I mean, you you outlined all the cases for everybody. Here's why I'm going to say it's not the Yankees. Brian Cashman has been in the organization since 1996, and he's he's been the general – basically, he's he's been the general manager – since 1998, they've they you know they they won early on, but look at where they've been. What's the standard been for the Yankees the last few years? They sure seem like they're content just to get into the playoffs. If they were under any real actual pressure to win a World Series, Brian Cashman would have been gone would like four years ago. Like they are completely content just to keep riding it out with Brian Cashman while he doesn't put a true championship caliber team on the field it is not the dallas cowboys there's no pressure there because the owner can't fire himself or won't fire himself and he's the one making all the calls with that so i can't say it's the dallas cowboys you know so basically a little bit different just because of the structure but both of them have completely comfortable people in 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 the positions of power calling the shots So I can't say it's them. Uh, You know, I would say, you know, like you said, even though the Lakers are the most recent to actually win a championship, I don't think there's necessarily pressure for them to win a championship this year, but it's coming. And so I think almost by default, I think it's the Lakers because I just don't feel like the other two, there's there's no real discomfort for either Cashman and there's definitely not for Jerry Jones. I see your rationale. Okay. The Lakers, there is pressure for the Lakers to win, and they're not winning. The Cowboys and the Yankees are content with the result that they're getting. The Lakers aren't. They they want a better result, and they're not getting it, and everyone knows that. Yeah, I don't know about Yankees and Lakers fans having realistic expectations. I think fans of all those teams have you know less than maybe realistic <laughs> expectations. But you know, because they're fans of – those teams. I think especially if you asked fans, you know, who live in those markets, I don't think that that uh if you pulled them what their expectations are, I think that a, a vast majority would say championship every year. So Monday was the 20th anniversary of the Derek Jeter catch at Yankee Stadium where he ranges behind third base into foul territory, catches a pop-up, and then he falls into the stands. My question to you do you buy or sell it as the most overrated play in baseball history? So <laughs> I sell it as the – let me make sure I, I read this word for word. I sell it as being the most overrated play in baseball history because I'm sure there is some other play that's overrated. But I'm buying it as an overrated play in general – I'm buying it as probably – people call it one of the most icon, iconic catches of all time. I'm definitely buying it as it being you know one of the most overrated iconic plays. And it, it's just simply 
It's a very routine play. He's tracking down a pop-up. It's the only part that makes it tough is that he falls into the stands. But at that point, he's already caught the ball. Right. Falling into the stand. It's not like he's falling into it's the stands like, and catching the ball. Right. He didn't he's make already catch caught while the ball. falling into the stands. Yeah. His momentum just, is just, just taking him into exactly. the stands. The play exactly. itself is not hard. It's just afterwards he falls into the stands and everyone thinks it's this tough play. It looks more iconic than it is. Exactly. It, it's all he did was make the catch and then go crashing into the stands. It's not right. like he's falling into the stands and making the catch at the same time. Exactly. Is that neither of those things are happening? He just he's he's basically an outfielder running down a fly ball, catches it, and then doesn't know where he's at and crashes into the stands. It's it's really not a hard play. Yeah. And I think actually what David is saying that his more iconic play is the flip play at a home plate against the Oakland yes. A's. I think that that. Is a much more that that is the like that is the play for me with Derek Jeter. I just feel like this play that we're talking about again, like if he's at the Oakland Coliseum, it's it's a routine pop up. He stands there and makes a catch because there's a million miles of foul territory at the Coliseum. The play again, it wasn't even made more difficult. It's just that the stands are closer, and so it looks more exciting because of the fact that he falls into the stands. But like you said, he makes the catch in plenty of room and fair territory. And then he falls into the stands because that's where his momentum is taking him. The flip play was a great play, you know. But again, you know, like this, the pop-up play that, that we're talking about, it's not like he's Willie Mays over the shoulder running down that ball in center field. And he's not Bo Jackson, you know, running up the left field wall, you know, and and, and making the catch. So I just think I, I've just always felt like because it looks good on video, it has got much more play than it deserves the Derek oh, Jeter 100%. play. Any, any home run that's been robbed is harder than that play by Derek Jeter. Yeah. Any any home run, any home run that has been brought back by an outfielder is harder than what Derek Jeter did. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It just looks tougher just because of Yankee Stadium dimensions and what happened afterwards. Fill in the blank. It's blank that Under Armour has signed the Cavender twins, Haley and Hannah, to a three-year brand ambassador partnership. Um, it's not surprising. And I'm just going to go out on a limb and say, I think that they are playing basketball more to do with their brand deals than they are to than what basketball, like providing talent to, to the Miami basketball Kyle over team. substance. Yes. They are, they are on that roster because of this, because of the brand deals they get, their influencers. They yeah, they couldn't make any money when they tried to retire. That's from what I mean. If they were that they good back. at basketball, they they never would have stepped away for that year. And right. and, and this the one twin, you know, coming back later than the other. Again, I think that all of this is happening. They had to find a college to essentially take them on. Miami was the path of least resistance. They've already been there before. They already know everything. How do we, you know? How do we make all these other brand deals work? Because they're always doing, you know, photo shoots for this, deals with this. So, again, it's not surprising to me because I think more so they're playing basketball because of the brands and not vice versa. They're not getting the brands because they're elite at basketball. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And obviously, you know, their their looks obviously play into it as well. For You know, like what – and it comes down to they've got a – Great big social media following. They've got like four and a half million followers on TikTok, apparently, which is just insane. Four and a half million on TikTok. But, you know, they're going out there, fish lips and, you know, doing their dances and everything else. And that's I mean, there are there are many more people who have less of a name and profile like. Sort of I, I don't want to say profile, but. People who I've never heard of, like, they, you know, I know who they are because I've actually seen them. They played against Notre Dame a couple of years ago, you know, when they transferred to Miami. But you're absolutely right. I just, it, it's like style over substance. But hey, I can't blame Under Armour because they're trying to sell their products. You know, they're going to go out there. They're going to pitch products, demonstrate products, do all this stuff. Under Armour wants to sell their stuff. This feels like something, you know, that like, you know, like, like, Riley Leonard's social media following is not near what the Cavender twins social media following is, but that is obviously 
gone a long way. But it feels like with with Notre Dame being the biggest brand, you know, school that Under Armour has, especially after, by the way, as you, you know, let me know today, Auburn left Under Armour and they're going to Nike now. But you know, it feels like feels like if if maybe some Notre Dame people kind of up their game a little bit, this is something that Under Armour should be in with a Notre Dame athlete. But I mean, that's a great point. Like I, I really do. Cause like they tried to sign some kind of developmental deal with WWE when they left basketball last year, but I don't think it worked out. And I think that that's ultimately why they went back to basketball this season to try to make more money off their, their social media. Speaking of TikTok, the latest TikTok travel trend is passengers sharing their stories of sitting silently and screen-free for long hours at a time during airline trips. They're, they're trips on airplanes. That means no phones, no iPads, no music, no sleep, no magazine stymie, no nothing. It's known as raw dogging a flight. Have you heard of this before? Before I brought this up, have you heard of this raw dogging? Yeah, thing? so I... I was, I couldn't, when you asked me this question, I, I honestly had to think, because I was like, did we talk about this? Because I recently saw this, and yeah, it's basically all you can literally do is stare straight ahead at the tri the flight tracker that shows, you know, you traveling uh, along to your destination. It's David Putty on Seinfeld. Have you seen that episode where he's yeah. just sitting there like... <laughs> but there's no music, no you know, sleeping, sleeping is the hard one for me because that, that can kill all time. Well, and again, like you're so bored, you're not doing anything else. I think your natural tendency would want to be. Yeah. You're literally just staring straight ahead the entire flight. Um, nothing else. How long I could make it maybe two hours. I that, think that, that was, the, that was what the question was going to be. What's the longest you could go on a flight with no form of like no like entertainment if, at all. If there was something on the line, of course, I could probably make it happen, right? Like if you were like a million bucks, fly five hours to California, well, yeah. I mean, you know that, what I mean? That's but, a different story. But just doing it to do it, I think my max would be like an hour to two, maybe. And then I would go to sleep or put in some music or something. My max is like 15 minutes, I think. <laughs> I have no shot. Stymie says five. And I, I, I fly enough that I know. It's like I've got to distract myself. And if I'm not doing one of these things, typically I listen, you know, like to podcasts when I'm flying, maybe do a little bit of reading, maybe get out the computer, do a little bit of work. If there, you know, some like some things to to write up and stuff like that, I've got to be doing something. I've got to kill that time because, you know, I, I can try to sleep on the plane, but I don't tend to sleep very well on the planes. Uh, especially like after games and stuff like that, when we're flying back, you know, cause your adrenaline is just kind of naturally, you know, pushed up from, you know, calling a game and, and things like that. But uh, you know, even if it was just a, a vacation, I would have no shot. I've got to be, I've got to have something to occupy my time when I'm on a plane. I can't just sit there and stare out into space with nothing going on. Cause you're not even supposed to snack, I guess. Like no snacks, no drinks, none of that stuff. Nothing. I don't understand why these things become trends. Like what? Like why would you want to do that to yourself? I know. I like know. you're not. It's not. You're not getting anything. Well, know? and now it's now it's becoming. You know, like uh, you know, like everyone's trying to one up each other. Because I think I saw like the the record is like eleven hours or something. Yeah, like, that. like international, international flights. Flight. Yeah. Heck no. Nuts. There's a debate going on in the chat right now. I want your opinion. Okay. Everything aside, you go back from the beginning. You know the numbers in career. You're getting out of Jeter and A-Rod. Who are you picking? One or the other. Jeter Everything 100%. else. To Jeter the 100%. Jeter 100%. Okay. He's a team guy. Like, say everything else that you want about him. The, like, team guy, still produced. A-Rod. Obviously a sketchy personality. I don't think that he was, I think, you know, like who was, who was more beloved in the locker room, in the clubhouse? Derek Jeter, right? Okay. What's your choice? I want to say A-Rod because <laughs> I get, I get caught up in the pop, you know, like the dude, he was, 
the, you can't like they were both really good defenders. So you're accepting the steroids and just that's why I said everything to the side, everything to the side, the steroids. You know, so we don't know about the steroids. That's what, what I mean. Every, okay. You're just looking at it at a surface level, you know, stats on paper. But you bring up a good point because a rod <clears throat> outweighs Jeter offensively. But what Jeter does in a clubhouse in terms of keeping a team together, right? That can you know outweigh offensive production. Honestly, this is why I brought it up. I think it's a good a good question. You said everything to the side, you know, like Jeter's persona and his, you know, who he how he thinks of himself and the steroids with A Rod and you know, just look at plain facts. I think it's hard it's hard to say, but I fall in love with a guy who can hit. But that's just naturally me because I I was a guy. Who enjoyed hitting, right? Yeah, so I mean, like, Jeter could hit. He just didn't have the home runs, obviously. He didn't have the slug. Had. But he was also a better day-in, day-out defender. I mean, A-Rod was still a decent defender you know, until he took the roids and got a little bit bigger. But, you know, Jeter was Jeter was a better defender as well. All right. I don't think there's a wrong answer. I just like to know people's perspective. Sure. I guess I shouldn't be surprised because you are you – are, you are all in. You and Evan Sharpley are all in on Bonds and A Rod should be in the Hall of Fame. Clemens <laughs> should be in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, I mean everyone was doing steroids that during that era. It's just a matter of who got caught and who didn't. Right. <laughs> I think mean, that's there's an argument for it. There's a legit argument. Even if you're swolled up, you still got to be able to flick that bat at the ball. You know, it's very true. That's very true. All right, well, that's going to do it today. Again, we're going to have a little bit of altered schedule this week because the 4th of July is Thursday. We've got a regular mailbag show coming up tomorrow. We in, we out. I'm going to post the thread on the Champions Lounge tomorrow since Thursday is the 4th, but we in, we out is going to be Friday instead of Thursday this week. Are you going to be with us on Friday this week? Um... You'll have to visit the calendar. So that's a yes? Calendar. <laughs> oh, you filled out the mysterious calendar now. Huh? I filled out the calendar. All right. All right. Well, that's going to do it for today as I go look at the calendar now and see what's going <laughs> up on Friday. Go out we in 6 a.m. golf and then we out. see if you... See if you get thrown off the course again. <laughs> Hit the like button before you check out. Appreciate you being here as always. And we'll talk to you later on Ivy Nation Sports Talk.